Hello friends, Bishop Andy C. Luther here and I want to welcome you to this mini webinar and lecture on Halloween. I am preparing this primarily for the students of the New Life School of Theology, which meets every Saturday here on our Long Island campus. Today I am talking about the Christian origins of Halloween. And while I will confess that in recent years there has been a campaign uh, especially in certain quarters of the Christian community, advising people to avoid observation of Halloween. I want to suggest in this particular lecture that Halloween, as it is practiced in this modern day, perhaps has more to do with Christianity than we either know or realize. Now, I understand that with its reference to ghouls, goblins, ghosts, witches, and warlocks, it is easy to think of Halloween purely as satanic worship. However, while I will admit that it is pagan in origin, its practice has a great deal to do with the church and the influence of the church on non-Christian cultures that the church came in contact with. So let's get started. Friends, the purpose of this particular lesson and lecture is to point out the curious history that exists between our modern practice of Halloween and its connection to church history. So let's go to the beginning with a quick discussion upon Celts and Druids. Celts. Now, it is spelled C-E-L-T-S, and here in America, we pronounce that as Celts, but actually, it is a hard C sound in terms of its original pronunciation. Friends, the story of Halloween begins some 2,000 years ago with the tribal communities of Northern Europe, known as the Celts, and their practice of Samhain. Now, you'll notice that this is spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N. However, it is pronounced Samhain. The way it is spelled might suggest that it is pronounced Samhain, but actually it is pronounced as Samhain. Now, the religious figures of these tribes, the Celts, were called Druids, who acted as what we would call today priests or indigenous holy men of that particular day and time. Let's see if we can take a quick look at who these Druids who lived amongst the Celts were. The Celts believe that each year at the end of the year, the veil that separated the dead from the living was drawn thin. As a result, it was possible for the dead to return and haunt the living for the last day of the year or the first day of the next year. Now, this was um, their new year, and during this time, it was believed that the living could come in contact with the dead. So, how did the Celts respond to this? To defend from being terrorized, the Druids, remember those were the holy men or the priests of that day, would build a huge bonfire that would burn all night and that the people used to light their torches that were returned home and used to warm their tents or huts for the duration of the winter. Now, let me explain this very, very carefully. Remember, this is Northern Europe. It is a very Arctic climate, very, very cold. And of course, the winters could be severe. So this bonfire that was built at the new year, which would have been the winter season, not only did it have the practical purpose of defending against the dead, but individuals would light their torches from this bonfire, take that torch home, and then they would heat their tent, their hut, their home. Now, failure to do so, or if that fire went out, they were exposed to the severity of the cold for the remainder of the winter, and they would surely die. So, from a practical point of view, this bonfire, this sowing, was their salvation each year, because without the fire, without this bonfire, without sowing, people could not survive the winter. They would surely die. Now, that is the way this custom Samhain 
operated amongst the indigenous tribal people of Northern Europe, but that is prior to their exposure and their contact with Christianity. When the church expanded into Northern Europe, the church would absorb the ancient custom of the people and redefine them in Christian terms. Now, let me pause here and remind you that the church had previously done this in other areas and other times. Uh, there was a Roman figure that was called Mithra, considered the son of the sun god. It is said that he was born of a virgin uh, and that he was literally the combination or the coming together of a god with a human maiden. Uh, his birthday was celebrated on the 25th of December. So as Christianity moved into Roman circles, they took the Mithridites or this Saul Invictus celebration and incorporated it into their own narrative and decided to call it Easter. In the spring of each year, there were festivals throughout the empire that celebrated the return of life. After winter, which was death, there was the return of life. This festival was known in many places as Ishtar. Uh, Christianity took that and turned it into Easter to celebrate the return of the dead of Jesus Christ. And so by the time the church gets to Northern Europe, it had mastered the technique of adapting to the native customs of the people who they were trying to reach. So that brings us that in the case of Samhain, the church used November 1st as All Saints Day, which in Latin would be Al Halamas. This day, the church taught, was a day to remember the souls of all who had previously died. Now, I don't have it here on the screen, but let me also remind you that it is in the year 609 AD that Pope Boniface declares All Saints Day, and this was done in part to co-opt or to absorb festivals like Samhain into the Christian calendar so that there could be a universal appeal of Christianity to all people around the globe. Now, because the belief that souls were in purgatory and had to be prayed out, the practice began that on the night before All Saints Day, children would go around and offer to pray for the souls of the dead in exchange for sweet cakes commonly called treats. Now, failure to give a treat resulted in the children playing a trick on the one who did not supply the treat. So this term and this phrase that you are so familiar with, trick or treat, actually comes from a Christian place or a Christian origin because the church at that time, primarily the Roman Catholic Church, was teaching that before judgment, souls went into this waiting station where great suffering took place. However, if you prayed hard enough, you could pray the soul of your loved one out of purgatory. And so in part, uh, the trick-or-treat or Halloween as it is being practiced today came from the result of this belief in purgatory and that children, because they were innocent and God would hear the prayers of the innocent, were able to pray souls out of purgatory. All righty. So how did we get from Al Halamas to Halloween? Well, for instance, all of this took place on the night before the new year. The term Hollow Eve was created, Eve, evening, which in the language of that day was pronounced Halloween. Why? Because in Latin, Eve is pronounced as Een. So All Saints Eve or Hollow Eve would have been pronounced Halloween. Now, when the Irish came to America to flee the potato famine of the 1830s, they brought their practices 
of Halloween with them. And that's how we got from these Celts with their Druids and their Samhain and their trick or treat and their purgatory, their belief in purgatory and uh, Pope Boniface co-opting and absorbing this custom into the Christian calendar to what we call it today, Halloween. Well, friends, that takes up just about all of my time, and I certainly want to thank you for yours. This has been my monthly presidential lecture of the New Life School of Theology. I want to thank you for watching. I do have some contact information here on the screen in case you have any questions about what I have shared with you today. Until next time, always remember, God loves you, I love you, and we look forward to seeing you real soon.